Yeah. All right. So relax. It's not too painful. <laughs> All right. So where we're up to in the conversation is what experiences or experience, singular, up to you, has affected your playing the most or how you produce sound? There's two major things. And one of them is sort of like an exposure to particular historical record. Mm -hmm. And the other one was sort of like exposure to a particular sort of like performative instance. Mm -hmm. Both sort of like separated by time, Mm -hmm. but both sort of like compounded themselves to sort of like really make me critically reflect on my understanding of sound and my understanding of the possibilities of sound in relation to music in relation to culture. One of those things was sort of like, you know, having a pretty killer, like, um, high school education in terms of exposure to modernist classical music and free jazz. Like, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, like, you know, from maybe year 10 to year 12 or whatever. Um, and you know, having great music teachers, which, who exposed me to, you know, the historical and, um, academic, appreciation of shit from Schoenberg all the way through to Xenarchus Mm -hmm. and you know like introduction to sort of um, I don't know Ornette Coleman and you know John Coltrane's post 1965 free jazz kind of stuff which opened me up to that kind of stuff because like I was into you know like rock and roll and metal and all of that kind of shit yeah the second one was when I played at one of the what is music festival gigs maybe in about 1996 mm-hmm. or maybe 1995 yeah and um nick Camvesis, who's an artist from sydney um mm. also does you know like a lot of voice related stuff he was a member of phlegm and um yeah. you know that whole sydney crew yeah. he did this performance which was totally about forcing the audience to question what he was doing if that was music yeah and it was one of those moments which totally fucked my brain in terms of what constitutes music yeah so both of those things combined like sort of like a, a you know a, an introduction to the let's say the 20th century avant-garde in sound and then a practical application of the most extreme version of that mm. they were the two things which really um, s- developed my you know like the last 20 years of my practice yeah what was the performance like what was it that really struck you about it he was basically uh, this was a gig at the punters club so yeah. you should be able to sort of like identify when that actually was so yeah. it was, maybe it was 95 or something like that i can't remember yeah. but um basically he sort of like had a mic mm-hmm. and he was walking around this the small punters club stage and yeah. sort of let us fucking hit in the wall and yeah. stuff like that and just doing some weird ass grunts yeah and stuff but it was all built up you know like in practical in all practical terms because it was like you know like a festival experience mm. you know it's like a fucking concert of a festival yeah. so everyone was like really psyched for some amazing music kind of thing to yeah. happen and what he did was totally expand that mm. and he was just walking around the wall hitting the mic hitting the mic on the wall doing grunts and all of that kind of stuff and then just stopped yeah how did that challenge your, your playing for that? like did you just kind of start to I'm curious of the repercussions. Like, they sound like amazing experiences. Yeah. Did you kind of all of a sudden start approaching your instrument or your composition or your playing approach specifically after that? Or was it just kind of like pop a different sec- section of your cognitive function re- to go, oh, hang on a second. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, re- I reckon you're right. It was yeah. sort of like a, a revelation, you know? Yeah. So, like, there was all of these sort of, like, bits and pieces in place yeah. which allowed me to appreciate it, but I was limited by, you know, like some structure of, okay, sound is authorised sonic events within a duration. You know, yeah. the classic definition of what is composition. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Whereas, like, what witnessing sort of like, you know, Campesis's performance was mm. like, no, sound is a mode of perception in a situation. It's got nothing to do with authorial intent. It's got everything to do with sort of like the the listener, the audience member making those connections themselves. It's got nothing to do with sort of like form or structure or sort of like, you know, typical, um, you know, sonic components, which we associate with, um, with music. Mm-hmm. It was actually more about us having the capacity to think beyond that stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, wow. And it just like, you know, fucking popped a vessel in my fucking synapses yeah. where after the gig, I walked out and I listened to all of the traffic in Elizabeth Street. I listened to all of the fucking chatter from people and all of that kind of stuff. And it was like, holy fuck, I can frame this as music as an auditor. Like I am finally sort of like, I wouldn't say finally, like it's not revelatory in that kind of sense, no, but it's no. more like, okay, music isn't an object which is imposed on someone who is the receiver of that information. Mm. Music is actually a situation where the receiver of the information can package those sensory inputs and turn them into what we call music. Yeah, yeah. It was like, yeah, revelatory in that kind of sense. Yeah. I assume also there'll be just as many people at that performance that kind of went, no. <laughs> like a polar opposite or was um, there... Yeah, I think, you know, yeah. there was, you know, lots of people were fucking pissed off with it and all yeah. that kind of shit, but there was <laughs> still lots of people as well who went, holy shit, that was amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's kind of great though, to have that sort of dynamic. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you know, to have that kind of like diverse um, response mm-hmm. to something like that, which when you think about it, historically isn't that difficult you know like we've got you know we've got precedents for that kind of stuff you know like even you know John Cage four minutes 33 seconds kind of stuff yeah Yeah. music is not on the page music is in the context etc 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 so there's all of those you know precedents for that kind of stuff yeah 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 that makes sense yeah Yeah. Uh, going back though to something you're saying about like high school and those teachers Hmm. what do you think though made you like like you're talking about like being kind of you know into metal and stuff like that back in those days what do you think uh how do, I package, how do I say this? What do you think made you susceptible to be interested in those sort of ideas at that, that point in time? Because there are, there, there are similarities for me like between those you know, genres mm. and like kind of similar sort of background. Yeah. But, but what do you think it was that made you kind of go, hang on a second, like mm. I, I have this interest in like kind of texture and, like, and rhythm in this sort of specific music. What was it that kind of allowed you access? Because that seems like a bit of a portal like into kind of everything else. Precisely. I reckon sort of like, you know, like metal is one of those music forms which trains you to appreciate unpopular textures. Yeah. So, like, timbrely, I was already exposed to the kind of noises that you get in Sinarchus, to the noises that you get in sort of, like, you know, interstellar space, like Rashid Ali and John Coltrane just going fucking crazy kind of shit. Yeah. It's, essentially, it's noise. Yeah. You know, and I was already familiar with that, you know, like with Slayer and Napalm Death and all of that kind of stuff. So I had an appreciation of those actual timbres, those mm. textures and all of that kind of stuff without understanding that that is what I was interested in as opposed to a traditional musical appreciation where you're focused on the harmony or the rhythmic structure or whatever. Yeah. So it's definitely sort of like, you know, having that that existing appreciation to perceive and appreciate particular textures. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's... It was textually... Uh, sorry, was the textual information what you think originally attracted you to those styles of playing to begin with? Like, was it those sort of textures that you were actually attracted to? Originally, I was attracted to them sort of like, you know, like as I was exposed to them. And it was sort of like, you know... Uh, novel ways of dealing with harmony novel day not not novel ways of dealing with melody and all of yeah. that kind of stuff but let's just talk about um serialism or something like that f- for an example yeah. um because you know I, I love diatonic music i love romantic music i love pop music i love all of that kind of stuff but also i'm interested in musical possibilities where sort of like that kind of dictatorship of harmony um is only one part of the the possibility so I was already open to the idea that, you know, like you don't have to have a tonal centre, you don't have to have this, that or the other thing, you don't have to have sort of like, you know, like equirhythmic stuff, you don't need to have sort of like very measured sort of mm. like metres in the rhythm or anything like that. You can sort of like, you know, like mix things up and produce novel sort of like combinations. Yeah, yeah. But thinking about it only in terms of sort of like, you know, harmonic, melodic and rhythmic structure yeah. discounts all of the other stuff that goes along with that i.e. sort of like, you know, like the, the nature of the sound itself and the way that you sort of like, you know, um, recompose the sound in your, in your, in your ears. Yeah, yeah. And that was the way where I was able to sort of like jump from having an appreciation already with metal yeah. to jumping into Zanarchus. Yeah. Because sort of like, you know, like some of those sort of like really sort of like abrasive microtonal sort of like, you know, stacked chord kind of stuff mm. that is in Zanarchus, like it's 
very similar to you know like a distorted guitar which mm. is not doing a um you know doing a, a sort of like you know like pentatonic or diatonic riff yeah you know and so you've already got that that capacity to understand that taste yeah that oral taste yeah, yeah. after like these kind of two separate realizations did creating if you become like harder or easier out of curiosity like sonically it like, became more enjoyable Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it became sort of like more open and more challenging, but then easier in a particular way. Because yeah. like in a sense, it's like sort of like freeing yourself of some rules mm-hmm. which have become redundant and all of these sort of like underlying um, thoughts that you've had suddenly become legitimate in a way. Yeah. I'm not talking about legitimacy in sort of like, you know, um, something that's right and something that's wrong Mm. but in terms of being able to create in that way Mm. there's no need to attach them to sort of like a particular structure or a particular set of rules because you know that those rules are only applicable to sort of like one specific thing yeah and as soon as you realize that there's sort of like all of these different fields of possibilities yeah. which utilize the same materials yeah. um, and only one of those fields is sort of like, you know, like the traditional romantic notion of, you know, what, what music is, yeah. then that's like, great, that's one set of possibilities. Yeah. But also we have the same um, ingredients and there's a whole shitload of other possibilities there. Mm-hmm. And so, like, yeah, in, in that sense, it made it easier because yeah. you were able to um, sort of, like, distinguish between the two. Go, yep, I'm definitely going to be doing this now yeah. and I'm going to be doing this at another time. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to, like, kind of retrain or reapproach your instrument from that point? Or could you easily, like, extend these ideas into, like, the instrumentation or that you were kind of already dealing with? Yeah. Um, so like in terms of my own practice, I did sort of like spend a lot of time sort of like, you know, engaging with sort of like, you know, like unpitched sounds um, with sort of like, you know, like anti-rhythmic um, kind of um, approaches yeah. to, to the instrument, yeah. um, incorporating a whole heap of sort of like randomized mechanisms so okay. that I could kind of like replicate some kind of aleatory or some kind of stochastic kind of thing yeah. um, on sort of like percussion devices and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it sort of like, it did mean that I was sort of like constantly experimenting with a whole shitload of materials mm. um, that, yeah, like just led to other possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was sort of like, you know, it was liberating in one sense, but it was like, you know, totally... Um, totally methodical in another sense it's sort of like as soon as this road opens up mm. you're able to go okay cool fucking hell I'm going to try this see yeah. what it see what it brings see if you know like you know um, if it's going to work um, for some more substantial musical idea that you have mm-hmm. it's interesting because I find like some well I think it's kind of an idea that some people find that sort of like that freedom as mm. like kind of the infinite and crippling as opposed to like no no it's possibility it's not infinite so it's kind of well, it's great, obviously, that you kind of have that perception of it as being, oh, no, no, like, this is difficult, but it's rewarding yeah. and pleasurable. Yeah. How did the pleasure... Because you mentioned it was, like, a lot more pleasurable in terms of playing. Yeah. So, you know, it's different, it's like, physically engaging with that style of playing as opposed to what you were doing? Yes and no. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I'm sort of, like, applying the same sort of, like, um, visceral responses as one would have to sort of, like, you know, like your... Um, early engagement with music. Yep. So, for example, if you're brought up in sort of like a diatonic um, culture, yep. you know, like you have sort of like particular learnt emotional responses to particular sort of like harmonic sequences yep. or to, to specific tempos and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, you can totally apply that and generate the standardised emotional response. Yeah. Similarly when you sort of like break down those structures, Mm. the sort of like the core response to those kinds of things can generate equally as visceral response amongst Mm. amongst you as a performer or amongst the audience or whatever. They may not necessarily correspond to a particular emotion, Mm. you know, but they do actually have an effect sort of like, you know, physically and and viscerally. Yeah, Yeah. 
Um, and so that was really easy. It's sort of like, so I didn't sort of like go from, you know, like, you know, totally headbanging to some slayer shit or whatever and yeah. going, oh, wow, this is, makes me feel really happy <laughs> to um, then going, okay, I'm making some really, I don't know, like multiphonic kind of layered harmonic screechy noise thing mm. on um, on a drum skin, which mm. sounds exactly the same as, you know, some distorted guitar thing in grindcore. Yeah. They both made me happy, you yeah. know, like they're very, very similar sounds and all of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was, it, was there a process of unlearning for you? Like I found when I kind of like made this jump or epiphany into things, it was like, there was a change in instrumentation for me, so that was one big thing, but also there was a kind of a process of like freedom through unlearning as in like, okay, yeah. and that's a challenge. I think that's maybe the easy way out of like kind of abandoning my old instrument, but I think Tamerly, yeah. that just wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. Um, and I don't think it was possible in my case. Yeah. Um, but there was also like a process of unlearning compositionally that kind of took place, which is good and still something that I'm kind of, I guess, going through. Do yeah. you have similar experiences? Yeah. Or? For, for sure. But yeah. then sort of like maybe, maybe not as, as conscious yeah. because, you know, like I'm, I still appreciate like, you know, like technical playing yeah. um, in whatever tradition mm-hmm. is technical playing in whatever tradition. Yeah. And it's all useful for the kind of music that you want to make. Yeah. yeah. So um, unlearning particular things, for me, they were less sort of like physical, less technical. Um, mm. They were more sort of like intellectual. Yeah. Sort of like going, okay, you know, like I would, you know, f- for example, like um, um, the group that I had with, with Dave Brown and Anthony Pateras, we kind of sort of like imposed some limits on ourselves, which had an effect of making us essentially unlearn particular approaches to like, you know, like the the traditional jazz trio of piano, drums, and guitar. Yeah. And that is, okay, we're not allowed to play conventionally. We have yeah. to sort of like always strive for sort of like um, textures or timbres, yeah. which um, have a crossover between the instrumental voices. Yeah. So that there's sort of like an ambiguity of what sound's coming out, yeah. regardless of how that sound is produced. Yeah. So in that sense, you're imposing those kind of limits to unlearn ways of traditionally engaging in that kind of in that kind of grouping. Yeah. 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 Or well, I guess per- push further development is another way of kind of. Yeah. Exactly. It. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Does that keep? Does that has that continued from kind of jumping into? Sorry, it's, it kind of feels weird now kind of talking about jumping into that way of playing because I know it's yeah. like that's obviously something you've been doing for quite some time. Yeah. But do you find it kind of continues to evolve? Like, you know, the listening and the performing and the experiencing, like, is it, is it kind of continuous for you? Like... What, what yeah. do you mean exactly? Just how it kind of morphs. Like, I kind of feel like no matter, like, the next album that I hear or some performances that I go to, like... I, I feel like I've got like kind of a good freedom in kind of what I do and I really enjoy that yeah. but the, the process of learning kind of always kind of continues and always kind of like morphs a bit further just when I see a performance that kind of has something unexpected yeah, but that's the that's the nature of sort of like you know like um being engaged in creative production anyway you know yeah. like everything's sort of like going to influence you everything's sort of like going to sort of like you know like intersect with stuff that you're doing mm. you may come back to it in the future or whatever you know like it's always going to be sort of like that. yeah that's the sort of like the organic kind of nature of yeah well look I guess I take it for space. granted but um, yeah. I've seen some people that don't seem to, <laughs> like from from in the outset and granted I haven't spoken to them about it I'm not trying to like you know yeah. ugh, go into any sort of arrogance about it but you know from the offset it's kind of like no no you seem to be kind of like repeating a bit of a model here and oh, that's kind yeah, of fine so for sure. some people it doesn't seem yeah. to be as evolutionary yeah. or as, as much of a road or a journey as in like oh no this is this is the thing that I did yeah. which is fine yeah um, but it's not necessarily the path that I chose on for creative practice, like that idea of a yep. re- reflective practice. So I think, are you talking more about, okay, so like when does your engagement with novelty sort of like plateau and then you sort of like continue with that sort of like that level of what you had developed yeah. in perpetuity as opposed to continuing on some kind of like exploratory yeah, Why? yeah. It's kind of like you get really specific after a while. Like, yeah. you know, kind of like, okay, this is this is the area that I'm, I'm very interested in. Yeah. And then that just kind of shoots off infinitely in its own direction, which is kind of yeah. great. So you've got your area yeah. of like kind of yeah. experimentation, engaged in experimentation, if you yeah. will. And it kind of like progresses, which I find to be really rewarding mm-hmm. and curious and challenging, all those things you kind mm-hmm. of spoke about. 
but, but yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm totally with you. And <laughs> I, I I don't reckon it's you know it's not it's not up to me to sort of like you know like make that judgment kind of thing because <laughs> no. I reckon I've sort of like settled into some some grooves in <laughs> yeah. terms of like you know the the palette you know instrumentation and all of that kind of stuff so yeah mm. but yeah perhaps i'm in that area where it's sort of like okay i've sort of like you know found some stuff that i'm really interested in and i want to explore it for a little while longer yeah and i'll just sort of like then jump on sort of like further exploration later on yeah, yeah. i'll leave that for other people to judge <laughs> totally. but i totally know what you mean but like mm. i reckon both things are, are legit you know, yeah like, oh, totally yeah, yeah yeah definitely agrees with that yeah in terms of like these experiences that like kind of influence practice yeah Re- more recently like they're obviously like you gave like two really like excellent examples of like kind of like what kind of changed that direction yep. have there been like recent experiences that have kind of resonated with you specifically in terms of like sound or arts practice in general no and this is where sort of like the um the theorization of this process mm. could be tied with what you're talking about about the practical application of these processes yeah so um I don't know. Like, I reckon that there's been no amazing sonic work done. Yeah. I reckon if I can quote really, really poorly, mm. um, who was that um, Canadian um, philosopher from the 90s, like Francis Fukuyama or whatever, mm. who said, um, yeah, postmodernism equals the end of history or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I fucking don't believe in that at all because yeah. I think, you know, like social change is totally possible, cultural change is totally possible and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. But... In terms of all of the possibilities that we have mm. in relation to sort of like what we've been doing over the last 100, 50, and 20 years, mm. there's just sort of like a complexification. I know that's not a word, but you know, like yeah. stuff, you know, like multiplication of possibilities. But the raw ingredients are all there already and really understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly by some, you know, some groups of people, some scenes or whatever, yeah. you know, like they really totally understand a lot of stuff. So, for example, like if you said, okay, like, yeah, there is no such thing as tonality yeah. because everything is just sort of like, you know, like a continuous variation in frequency, yeah. blah, 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 similarly to rhythm, blah, 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 you know, like everyone is already talking and doing all of that kind of stuff. So in one sense, I'm like, okay, well, there is no more because that is it because yeah. like sound is limited to human perception we've sort of like reached the the limits of understanding of what it's possible for humans to hear. Mm-hmm. And we've also sort of like reached the sort of like aesthetic limits of the organisation of those, you know, physical disturbances for humans yeah. to actually process in an aesthetic way. Mm. Right. So that's the fucking conservative answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> but um, in all practical terms... Novelty is novelty. Culture is like, like um, I don't know. It's easy to say like William Burroughs kind of culture is a virus. It's always going to fucking mutate. It's always mm-hmm. going to create some novelty and all of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's true. You know, like you know, culture is like unlimited mm-hmm. in terms of the variations that are possible. Yeah. So when you're talking about like no great sound being achieved do you think it's going to be achieved or it no be... it's already done it's already done yeah yeah so yeah like there's all this stuff <laughs> all right so yeah what do i listen to i don't know like d'angelo or you know the latest kill record or you know <laughs> some retarded passenger of shit stuff or you know some super abstracted um you know conventional um non-idiomatic improv stuff mm. or whatever yeah. you know like essentially there's no surprises left Maybe that's me being super conservative, but like there's seriously no surprises left if you take on board the whole sort of like possibility. Yeah. I don't see that as being a bad thing though. Yeah. Yeah. Because th- for me, I feel like that kind of like creates freedom without necessarily arrogance because no one's trying to say that this has never been done before. Yeah. Well, people still try and say that. Yeah. But in terms of like the, the creative sphere, it's like, okay, well, if you assume everything's done before, then you can just kind of get back to work. Weirdly. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, totally. for, for me, it's like, okay, yeah. well, I'm not trying to like reinvent the wheel it's already yeah. been done creatively speaking I can just engage with this and that's okay yeah. Yeah. Um, I can sharpen my own kind of tools here and, and that's fine they, they, they already exist but, yeah. Um, yeah. like w- when there's some sort of like you know post-human sort of like mechanical augmentation to humans capacity to listen mm. then I think we all sort of like you know like start experiencing some completely new things mm. but we're, we're not sort of like able to do that yet mm. um, 
so I think the the field you know like to use some Deleuzean kind of thing about sort of like the space yeah um, that has been revealed to us I don't think there's any more surprises that we're going to get out of the field mm. it's just a matter of like just yeah you know just being um, receptive to all of the novel um, combinations of mm. the stuff within the field yeah yeah yeah. sonically speaking like you've spoken he's about like you know obviously like a, a broad variety of things that you enjoy yep. have you ever found texture that you just like nah like that's you know specific recordings where you're like that is actually really hard to listen to and I I don't find pleasure in or I don't find it interesting yeah. like kind of something that repelling I there are things that that physically um, I find challenging but I enjoy the exposure to physically challenging stuff yeah, yeah. so I will try to you know like appreciate stuff for its um f- for the things that it is trying to achieve yeah. so like for example and obviously there's sort of like you know like physical limitations here as well you mm-hmm. know, like um um sort of like you know like high frequencies or um super low frequencies mm-hmm. which is sort of like you know barely audible for humans and all of that kind of stuff yeah. they do create sort of like uh physical or visceral um, responses. Totally, yeah, like um, stuff. Yeah. yeah, but I'm I'm totally into into experiencing that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I found one once that was I can't remember the artist, but it was basically just like a recording of dry reaching. Um, yeah. and I found that physically really hard to deal with. I found was, it interesting because was, it was the first thing that could trigger, trigger such a like yeah. physical response. Was it just because of the content itself, or was it actually sort of like some of the physical properties of the sound? I think it was just. I think it was actually the physical properties of the sound triggering physical responses in me, yeah. which was you know quite quite a new thing. Like, yeah. bodily responses is probably a better way of putting it. But that's the only thing where I've been like, yeah. no. Nah. And and incidentally, sim like similarly, it's like, yeah. oh, this is actually quite interesting. Like I've never yeah. actually been physically moved in this way by a recording before. Yeah. So I sat through it to the end. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's kind of interesting when you get to that mode of reception to artwork because. As you said, everything's already there, and it's all these different things that you kind of modulate with. Yeah. But then ideas of good and bad almost kind of get yeah. thrown out. Well, that's where like you need this. to sort of like separate the thing from sort of like, you know, like making the value judgment, because mm. like, you know, value judgments are sort of like, you know, like communal, cultural, um, discursive, all of that kind of stuff. Mm. They're separate from the actual sort of like physical properties of the sound itself and yeah. the capacity of humans to actually perceive those sounds. Yeah. And so, like, you know, making it's it's pretty easy to sort of like you know like make a, a a a distinction between those things, but appreciate them simultaneously. Yep. So you can kind of go, okay, yep, like this is like some weird ass like you know, I don't know. You give me sort of like a frequency range which is horrible for teenagers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like what is it like twenty three thousand k or something? Yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Some shit. I've yeah. got to read up on my science. <laughs> yeah. But something like that, yes, it generates a specific physical, you know, response. Yeah. But then the work about sort of like judging that in terms of sort of like aesthetics or, you know, cultural acceptance or taste or blah, 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 blah. Mm. That's sort of like a secondary component. Yeah, or yeah. Not, not a secondary component in terms of importance, but, um, yeah. you know, like those things can happen simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also just that ha- choosing how you choose to engage with that. Sort yeah, of totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I reckon like, you know, fucking aesthetic judgment of music is mm. aesthetic judgment of music, mm. you know? And it is solely based on cultural conventions and sort of like perceptual capacities of the people who are who are listening mm. and making their judgment. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it all just comes back down to the listener. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, and like the listener can be a collective listener. It can be a culture. It can be a society. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why we have fucking genres which are different between different regions in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, you can't tell me that, you know, like diatonic music, you know, as it's molded in the in the late nineteenth century, mm-hmm. is the pinnacle of music when fucking all of these people in I don't know, like Kurdistan have completely different fucking harmonic and rhythmic systems yeah, yeah. and the music's equally as awesome. Yeah. You know? Like, it's fucking retarded to think that there is some kind of, you know, like, scientific, scientifically provable sort of, like, norm of music construction which is beyond culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry, we've actually just turned off at that point. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I was like, uh, uh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, wow. So I got a smart arm. Good finish. <laughs> Very strong finish. Whew. Cool. Yeah, yeah. 